Okay, let's talk about the path to 2020 right now, because even though we're only a week out from the midterm elections, it's not too early to start talking about this. I saw some tweets last week and this week that really made me rethink how the 2020 map is looking. The idea of Arizona being more of a, a purple, even blue state, for example, Colorado being a blue state, uh, Florida being a red state, and then Ohio being a solidly red state. How do you think the path to 2020 is looking? Well, I think a smart Democratic campaign will take a broad approach at first and look at all of the potential paths to victory. That's what we did on President Obama's re-election campaign when we actually did take a look at um, whether Arizona or Texas were winnable, and we started to narrow the map over time um, towards the closest states. I actually think in 2020, it really depends who's at the top of the ticket. So if you're talking about a candidate like Joe Biden or Sherrod Brown, um, that path may still run through Ohio and Pennsylvania and longtime industrial states. Um, if you're talking about um, a next generation candidate, um, someone like uh, Kamala Harris, for example, um, she may be taking a closer look at the path of victory through um, Sunbelt. I think the state of Florida, we never want to give up on. It's a microcosm of the country. It's really sort of five states within one state. And I think that's why you see out of eight votes, we're really down to 15,000 votes in the Senate race there. Ben, of those uh, potential contenders that you listed, who do you think actually has the best chance in 2020 of taking on President Trump? You know, it, it's, it's sort of a, a long time talking point that this time I believe that the primary is going to be really important to determine which candidate rises to the level. Uh, I think we've got some incredible talent running. It'll be the broadest field in my lifetime, and I think the most talented field in my lifetime. Uh, we need a candidate who can do two things. Number one, mobilize a diverse coalition um, that objects to the way that Donald Trump has governed the country and distorted American value. But I think we also need to break into some of those voters who voted for President Obama and then for Donald Trump, who worry about um, what their role is in the economy, an economy that's increasingly globalized and automated. If you're from a town that's lost their core industry, we really need to lay out a vision uh, from education all the way through modernizing retirement security um, to give workers a sense of what role they can play in today's economy. Yeah, so Ben, which Democrat uh, did that successfully in the midterm elections? You know, I, I think one place we can draw inspiration from uh, is Sherrod Brown, uh, my former boss. I worked on his first Senate race. And if you take a look at it, Republicans won every statewide office in Ohio. Um, but Senator Brown got reelected by a decent margin. I think part of that is he campaigned on um, what he calls the dignity of work. Um, he has uh, both um, protected manufacturing jobs where possible, but also looked to investments in the new economy in places like clean energy where Ohio can thrive. And he knows that having a job is, is more than just about economic security. It's about having the dignity to be a member of your community to provide for your family. He's made that a centerpiece of all of his campaigns, and I think it's really resonated across the state. Ben, let's talk Florida. Uh, recount efforts still ongoing. What is your outlook for what, what the outcome is? Well, look, I, I wouldn't bet against Mark Elias, who's the election attorney on the ground. Um, as I said, we're down to a 15,000 vote margin um, in the Senate race out of 8 million votes cast, and we know that thousands of ballots have yet to be counted. Um, I think Governor Scott is worried, um, or he wouldn't be trying to use law enforcement to stop election officials from counting the votes. Um, there's been two actions in court so far. They found no evidence of fraud, which is what Governor Scott claimed was happening in some of these counties. I think we're sticking behind the principle, which is every vote should count. Count every vote, and that will lead us to the verdict. Why do you think it's been such an issue in Florida, not just in this election, but of course, in previous elections, most notably the presidential election of 2000. Why is it always Florida uh, that gets the bad rap for having to do these recounts? Well, I, I think part of it is uh, is because Florida is representative of, of the nation and we're living in a divided nation right now. Um, if you go to Miami or you go to the panhandle of Florida, um, they feel like different states that represent different parts of the country. There's transient populations that have come from different parts of the country, but I think we need to take a close look at our election laws. Um, many more laws have been passed in the past five years to suppress the vote than to really figure out how all votes can be counted and counted efficiently and counted quickly and making sure that we don't have long lines on election day and that everybody who wants to vote gets a chance to vote. I think, you know, after this election, 
really need to take a step back and look at how to improve the system. Ben, at Bully Pulpit, you consult with some of the biggest tech companies in the world. How, how much more proactive do you think tech companies have been recently when it comes to corporate consciousness, when it comes to regulation, and to what extent are they waiting for the government to make these decisions? Well, you know, I think the past year um, was really um, a wake-up call. Um, I think tech companies were worried about a regulatory threat. Um, you had Democrats who were upset with the election results and, and the hacking and the election integrity efforts in 2016, and Republicans were, were upset that they felt like the employee bases um, of tech companies were voting Democratic. So you had a, a hostile crowd from both sides in Washington. Um, I think tech companies um, have taken a look at their reputations and considered how they can show that they're promoting economic development in the middle of the country. Um, creating jobs um, throughout the country, supporting small business throughout the country. Mm. Um, and so I think they've made strides in that direction. I think there will be a big debate over um, a privacy law over the next couple of years, especially with the Democratic House. I think that um, tech companies would be smart to embrace a form of legislation that they can accept because this has become top of mind for for consumers and um, you know, impressions of, of the largest companies have really taken a hit over the past couple of years. Uh, well, well, Ben, one company that's getting a lot of criticism for not creating jobs in the middle part of the country is Amazon, today announcing Crystal City, Virginia, out of, in Arlington, Virginia, uh, is the site of one of its HQ2 locations here in Queens, New York, the site of the other one. Uh, what do you make of the way that Amazon went about doing this over a year long and, and getting these uh, different cities all over the country to essentially compete for, them, for, for their win? I got to tell you, it felt like a brilliant marketing campaign until the outcome. Um, you know, this was this was a big drum roll, and they went throughout the country, and they went to Denver, and they went to Columbus, and they went to Chicago, and they couldn't find a headquarters site outside of D.C. and New York. I think that sort of, you know, reemphasized this perception of of the tech elite just creating white collar jobs um, on the coast. I think it would have been a brilliant marketing campaign had they landed somewhere else. Um, and now there are real questions about, um, you know, whether they did this just for data collection purposes on uh, consumers across the country. All right. Ben LeBold, partner at Bully Pulpit Interactive. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.